Welcome back to the show where we highlight the obstacles and barriers that stop people from getting stuff done, otherwise known as monsters and myths. And I'm really excited about today's guest. I know I often say this, but I, this, is, this is somebody very special to me because I played a very small part in her journey at one point when I was uh, a mentor at Startup Bootcamp. Um, and I've only recently discovered a whole number of fascinating facts about her that hopefully she's going to share with us today. So uh, Becky Downing, please can you tell everybody on the show a little bit about yourself and we're going to dive straight into your story because I know people are going to love this. Just a warning, sit back, grab a cup of coffee, tea, water, your favorite beverage, because you really are going to want to listen to this one with your full attention. Becky. Wow, thank you. That's quite the introduction. Um, I should hire you to do my PR, Andrew. That's brilliant. Um, and also, you know, do not underestimate the impact you had with your mentoring. It certainly wasn't a small part. It was, uh, you know, most valued at the time. Um, so, yeah, by way of introduction, um, I am the ex-CEO, uh, it's quite weird saying ex, uh, and founder of Buzz, uh, Buzz Move, Buzz Survey, Buzz Bolt. Uh, and I'm going to relate the story of all of that to you as part of this podcast. Uh, I am a recovering lawyer uh, and uh, I'm also recovering from uh, an affliction called startup codependitis, which I'll tell you all about later as one of my monsters. Uh, so yeah, I guess in, by way of background, I grew up in Holland. Uh, so my parents were expats. And uh, so I went to a Dutch primary school. I lived on a street with a windmill on it. Uh, I literally even wore clogs to school in my early years. Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to have so to ask for some photo, photographic evidence of that. You and clogs. I... It, it exists. Whether I share it or not is another question, but, but that evidence does exist. Um, and so I guess by the time I was 12, uh, I was fluent in Dutch. Uh, I was very Dutch. Um, and my English was abysmal. And my parents always had the idea of going back to their uh, country of origin, uh, England. And so they quite wisely sent me to an international school um, to get my English back up to scratch. And uh, I was always, a, I was always a, an aspiring entrepreneur even back in those days, I suppose, uh, and had these kind of little Dell boy ventures going on on the side. Uh, and one of them was when I was a first year at high school, um, you know, it was quite sort of, uh, had a bit of an American culture. And so uh, it published this yearly yearbook and it was published by the fifth years uh, at school. And um, I remember thinking, you know, it, it was all basically the, the whole of the yearbook was all about the more senior years. And I thought, well, that's not fair because, you know, these sort of younger years aren't really getting any exposure here. And so I kind of innocently started this movement of uh, starting an alternative yearbook. And uh, it gathered quite a lot of steam actually, which was quite surprising because I thought, you know, it's a bit of a ridiculous idea to start, you know, here I am just this little first year uh, tr trying to make a bit of a change. <laughs> and little, you know, within a couple of months of doing this, I actually got pulled into the headmaster's uh, office and not only did he express, you know, real disdain and uh, disappointment in what I was doing, um, but he actually threatened suspension, which to say I'm not proud of because I certainly was not a rebel at all um, at school. I was, you know, the opposite. I was a total nerd. So I was dismayed by the situation. I was like, you know, why on earth would you do that? And, you know, it basically had gone and ruffled a few feathers here and there. So for me, it was kind of like quite an early lesson, really, in terms of, you know, what where there is a, a real customer need, which to be fair, you know, if you were to compare it to, uh, you know, building a startup now, I, I kind of saw kids at height, you know, the younger years as being the customers because the vast majority of them would be buying the yearbook and the older years and the teachers are kind of like the incumbents and they don't want things to change. And, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. And um, 
you it, it was kind of an early lesson and you need to be quite resilient as an entrepreneur and have a thick skin because as soon as you start making any kind of change to the status quo um you will be met with some kind of resistance um and uh, you know, more on that later so but, I, um, I, but yeah I, i've always I've, I've said it repeatedly across the show and keynotes and everything i identify with a tribe of entrepreneurs have generally got a common spirit of being troublemakers. And you've <laughs> proved that, you know, troublemaking from an early age and getting that, that's, you know, uh, but, but the core element is not troublemaking for the sake of making trouble. It's people that are dissatisfied with the status quo. Right. They are yeah. dissatisfied with the way that things are. Yeah. And they believe it can be done better. better. Yeah. And that's exactly what you did. So you proved your entrepreneurial roots all the way from back then. <laughs> yeah, and that really is a common theme uh, behind you know, all of the businesses that I started. I came at it from being a disgruntled customer um, rather than being sort of an expert uh, in the subject matter. Uh, but yeah, so no, that was, I had absolutely no intention really at the time to um, be a rebel. So I got my head down and graduated from school and then uh, moved to England uh, to go to university in Newcastle uh, and study business because, you know, it was always a big dream of mine to start my own business. Uh, but uh, once I graduated from that, uh, I, I didn't really have the confidence to kind of strike out my own and start my own business and also and this kind of leads me to the first myth and by the way as part of this uh i've uh chosen to make my monsters into viruses because you know it seemed rather apt being in the middle of a pandemic to give them all virus names so i'm going to call this the big idea influenza right because i which i was absolutely infected by as, as many people are this idea that, you know, if you have the big idea, then you are, you know, on the highway to Unicornville and that's what it's all about, right? Um, and I didn't have one. Um, so, and just to kind of elaborate on, on that, you know, the idea really is 0.1% of the overall recipe of success when it comes to a business, right? Um, you know, there are so many more factors that, that that come into play. You know, is the business model right? Is there a market? Is there an opportunity? Do you have your distribution channels lined up? You know, is your product nearing anything near product market fit? And you know, I, I did a bit of mentoring at accelerators as well. And you'd have these aspire, you know, these brilliant aspiring uh, founders and uh, come up to you and go, you know, I'd really love to have your feedback on my idea. Go, like, yeah, sure, no problem. You know, what is it? And then the next thing you'd know, they'd hand over this printed NDA for me to sign before they would tell me what their idea was, which I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, I have no real problem signing that, but just so you know, I have no intention of stealing your idea because it, you know, the first thing I have to say is that it really is going to be a very, very small part of your success one way or another. But, you know, lots and lots of people think that, um, they need, you know, that's sacrosanct. So, so that's my first virus, uh, the big idea influenza. Um, and that really is, it's a huge myth that, that the idea is something to viciously pre uh, protect because 99.999% of the time, no matter how a unique people think their idea is somebody else has already thought of it somewhere else in the world oh yeah it, it really yeah. coming up with something that's truly unique as a concept is i i mean it's it's almost impossible the secret source is always in the execution it's yeah. getting the damn thing done yeah, that yeah. and how you get it done is how you execute on the idea not the idea itself and, and I've had people come to me before and go, I've got this brilliant idea. Do you think I can sell it? And I go, ideas are cheap. You know, you can give ideas. As a matter of fact, you can't even give ideas away a lot of the time because you might have a great idea. But if you haven't, as you say, established your product market fit, market need, that kind of thing, 
it, it's not a great idea in the first place and nobody's going to pay you for it because it's not their idea that's not where the money lies stop mm, mm, mm. no absolutely i feel your frustration yeah but um so i that is what i thought and so i kind of segued at that point and went all right i'll go to law school um because i thought you know I'm, I'm reasonably okay at logic i'm quite argumentative you know it's going to be a well-paid job it'll be reasonably challenging and i also thought it was going to be like that um show from the 90s ali mcbeal did you watch that show i did there was this did. Yes. female lawyer that had this crazy weird dancing baby in her head which i think represented her her broodiness um it was a massive and, meme at one stage, the dancing. Yeah, game. yeah. And they seem to spend like 25% of their time in court arguing and 25% in those weird unisex toilets and 50% of their time um, in a wine bar that was kind of permanently annexed to the office building that they were in. Um, I just thought that was brilliant. Um, but uh, well, there's the wine bar was the attraction, was it? <laughs> Yeah, I just thought it was going to be like that. And so there's a bonus myth for you. Being a lawyer is not like being an Annie McBeal in, in, in the slightest. Um, but still, I, I um, practiced for eight years. I did uh, commercial litigation and, you know, uh, actually um, it was a great experience. I wouldn't have it any other way. It actually really teaches you to be extremely commercial and, uh, and help solve your clients' problems. So not a bad segue overall, uh, but you know, I always had in the back of my mind, I really want to start my own business. And so I hit the big 3-0 age-wise and like, you know, you have this kind of mini crisis of now or never. And I know that <laughs> we're coming up to Valentine's Day, right? So I know that, you know, it was exactly nine years ago because, and it was really badly thought through and not at all intentional, but I decided to resign on Valentine's Day. And uh, so as I enter my senior partner's office with an envelope in my hand, and uh, as soon as I saw his face, like uh, completely burn up, I was like stuttering away going, this isn't a Valentine's Day card, it's my letter of resignation. It was all very awkward and not at all how I imagined that moment would be. But, you know, the first thing, uh, he asks, of course, is well, what are you going to do? Uh, or no, actually, what firm are you going to? The assumption obviously was going that I was going to a competitor firm. And I sat there and went, no, I'm going to start my own business. And, you know, just the look of relief on his face of, okay, this person is clearly crazy and deluded. And so actually we're better off without her and off we go. Um, and so that leads me on to my next virus, which is, you know, then I thought, okay, uh, if I can build a business around something I'm passionate about, right? And there's lots of books out there that will say this and evangelize this. If I can build a business around something that I really feel strongly about, then I will definitely be successful. And so I call this virus ignoramus passionitis. Um, and so at the time, uh, I had this passionate aversion against the color pink. <laughs> And the reason for this was, you know, I didn't have kids at the time, but I always wanted them. And uh, whenever I went into kids' clothes shops, you look and you see like this, either this sea of pink or this sea of blue. And I was like, you know, but there are so many different colors on the spectrum of, of colors. You know, why does it have to, why is it so gender divided? You know, and as I said, I grew up in Holland where, uh, and I think Scandinavia and continental Europe, that clothing tends to be a bit more colorful. And, that's what I remember from my childhood. And I thought, okay, so I set up this website, which I called Unicorn Kids, with the uni kind of being a reference towards unisex. Um, and but I can tell you, it, it, it was anything but a unicorn. Um, it, it, it went horribly wrong because although I was sort of jumping out of bed every single day with this kind of mission uh, to kind of battle the evil that was pink. Um, I, you know, there are many different parts of the business plan that I just hadn't thought through, such as the holding of stock, right? And then I, you know, obviously you have to invest in that up front and I did actually invest some of my own savings into that, which was a bad idea. Um, you know, getting them, I knew nothing about online marketing, for instance. So, you know, uh, even though I had this nice website, like uh, I, I didn't know how to attract customers to it and et cetera. So, 
So the point is, you know, uh, there are again all of these. It, it kind of, it, you know, is is very similar to the big idea. Uh, so, you know, it's there are so many other elements that are, are way more important. So I had quite a few sort of little failed ventures like that, which I sort of built around beliefs and passions like that didn't quite work out. And of course, the irony is that I now have six year old twin girls who absolutely love the color pink. <laughs> so, uh, and this is a battle I have chosen not to fight because uh, there are more important things in the world, really. Um, but yeah, they are definitely going through their pink phase right now. I was going to say maybe time to revamp the idea and uh, you know um, just bring back all pink, you know, just for oh, the kids. No, I won't go that far. <laughs> and and this is very much a common myth where where you'll find the. Um, the influences and the people who are trying to sell courses on how to be entrepreneurial and and always front and center is find something you're passionate about and and i think something you're passionate about is great for uh, what i term a side hustle and i have a number of side hustles they are a creative relief for me a lot of the time they're a way for me to pick up and learn skills um, and some of them I'm quite passionate about, um, and and uh, it's good fun, but that's not that's not what you need. Passion alone is not going to give you a good business. You can be as passionate as hell about something, and that so you've got your great idea, your big idea, because you've caught your big idea influenza, um, and you've got passionatus. Uh, because you're really passionate about it, that's still not going to guarantee your success at all. all right. But how many of the people that you have spoken to and mentored will actually believe you? Will they listen when you say that's not enough? How no, you I, it's a really tricky conversation because these people are so passionate about what they do and you do not want to undermine that. Um, you know, it could be... Um, in fact, I remember having a conversation with someone who wanted to do uh, the Shazam for a specific type of orchid. And I was like, okay, I get that you really love orchids, right? Um, and I do not mean to undermine that, but is your, but mar how many of you are there? You know, is your market big enough? Um, so, but yeah, it's very, very difficult because as entrepreneurs, we often are, have to be quite single-minded and deluded as I have been many times as well. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to give that feedback, but lots of people think, you know, I'm passionate about it. So lots of other people will be too. And so I am on the highway to Unicornville with this idea. Um, and sadly, and, that's often not the case, yeah. And where, where I find that particular, though, both of those two myths together combined, or monsters together combined, viruses, you know, a double, a double dose, in corporate environments, as opposed to entrepreneurial environments, in corporate environments, those become very often senior executive passion projects that mm. are unstoppable. And yes. they end up sucking so much resource. And I had a, um, I, was, I was on a call a while ago, it was a panel session that we had run where a guy described, and literally they put this in the agenda as this, the regular monthly kill the baby sessions. Yeah. Specifically, yeah. specifically to identify the uh, projects that were led by delusion more than anything else, where there wasn't enough rigor around the, the market sizing opportunity, whatever the case was, and they'd got onto the plan because somebody passionate had pushed it forward and managed to rally lots of support for the initial concept. But they very correctly had structured a very strict proof of concept slash MVP phase. And if the project did not pass, that was a pass fail. You know, you either okay. prove the concept or you refute the concept. And if you haven't proved the concept within a specific timeline and budget, then you've either got to re, re, uh, um, rework your concept 
mm-hmm. or we kill the baby. Yeah. And he said they saved millions, literally millions, because they had projected how much some of these passion projects would have cost them mm. to get to market with no return. Yeah. So I agree. It's very much harder to do to a solo entrepreneur or founder or, or even founding team that is really passionate. But thankfully, in the corporate environment, there is a there is a cure or at least a vaccination against your. Yeah. Your and gosh, I, I wish I had some. I mean, uh, as I'll explain later, I, I could have done with that kind of tough love in places myself. Um, and, you know, part of the problem is, you know, you, you end up investing so much time and energy and finance into something. Um, and then you come up against something that I talk about quite often, which is the sunk cost fallacy, right? You think that, right, I've invested so much of my time and energy into, could be anything, right? Uh, but in this case of business, if I continue investing time and energy and money into this, then eventually it will sort itself out and become successful, which is the sunk cost fallacy. You know, um, actually, no, you need to learn to let go and cut your losses. Uh, and further investment does not ensure success uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, yeah, and hence kill your, kill your darlings. But, you know, it, that's going to be easier for someone. Uh, what what a, it's a bit like being a traffic warden, isn't it? Like have to have to go in and kill other people's babies must be quite tricky, but highly necessary, I think, in many cases. It's it's um, one to me. It's one of the fundamental roles of a non-executive team. So preferably non-execs that are not in it for equity, because often they've got a a vested interest in trying to at least see um, see it all the way through no matter what the cost on the right. vain hope that they their equity is going to be worth some money and mm. and i i often encourage people um to take on at least one independent non-executive that does not hold equity in the organization that can be right. completely impartial that mm-hmm. has no vested interest that obviously is is there you you would have to pay them but is there to give you sound advice. They are your trusted business advisor and they need to warn you way in advance if you are behaving these kind of, de- be- if you are, uh, are displaying these kind of behaviors. Mm-hmm. And also they need to bring it to the rest of the board's attention and be resilient enough to stand up in front of the board and go, I call bullshit on the whole bunch of you. Yeah. This, this is now the time where you cut your losses, you take your tax write-off with SEIS or anything like that, and you move on because mm-hmm. th- this has this has we've we've had our pass fail criteria, it's failed. Now, unless yeah. we pivot completely and we go in another direction and we come up with a decent plan for that, you're just going to be throwing more good money after bad. And and very often I've seen people only make that call three years down the line and after significant rounds of investment yeah. from people that have right. just had to write off. And, and that absolutely changed my experience, uh, which uh, we'll get into doing this in chronological order. That's the way my brain works. Because um, I'm, I'm keen to know what <laughs> happened next after your failed mission against Pink. Right. So literally then I sat in the uh, British Library for three months and decided to study industries uh, to figure out you know where the opportunities lay and I, I did a complete you know 180 in terms of you know and ended up building businesses in decidedly unsexy uh, industries uh, being removals and insurance um, and so the way I came to the removals industry was uh, I did you know going back to uh, the original point of coming at it from a disgruntled customer point of view, I had experienced a, a really negative move um, about a year prior, where I thought, okay, you know, how hard is it really to hire someone to move things from A to B successfully? Well, as it happens, quite a lot can go wrong. So guy turns up in a ramshackle van late, uh, you know, drops my TV in the process, was not insured for that. Um, you know, and a lot of these man and vans 
they will charge you by the hour, they get stuck in London traffic and uh, it ends up being a lot more expensive than what you budgeted for. So, um, and I remember thinking um, in particular, you know, there's no transparency around pricing uh, and there are a lot of rogue traders. It's in a completely unregulated market and uh, dug a bit deeper when it's also extremely fragmented because the barriers to entry are, are very low. You know, all you need is a man in a van and off you go, which is highly frustrating as you can imagine for the more uh, professional companies who pay their employees proper salaries, et cetera, and therefore needs to charge higher prices. Uh, so I thought, okay, um, and crucially, um, the industry hadn't been penetrated really by technology. So that's what uh, gave birth to Buzzmove, which at the time uh, was Europe's first online price comparison booking platform for all things home moves. And that flow so easily, you can tell I pitched that a million times over the last eight years. Uh, and it's all built around the frustration of moving, which uh, you know, it's crazy. It's actually up there in terms of divorce and bereavement, etc. As far as you know, stressful life events are concerned, it is up there. So, real customer problem, fragmented industry. You know, no real technology penetration. I was ticking all the boxes, and uh, uh, you know, got investment for it. Um, also, not not to spend my own savings. Uh, or, you know, on on a venture and. Like genuinely, if, if it's a good business plan, then you should be able to raise money for it. And um, I did actually literally have investors say, we cannot pick holes in your business plan. There were holes, believe me, and, we, and we'll, come, we'll come to them. But at the time, it all seemed pretty foolproof. And we launched that. And um, so a big part of that was, uh, so to be able to determine how much a home move is going to cost, um, central to that is understanding, you know, what are you moving? Because that determines, you know, the size of the van, truck you need, the amount of people, how long is it going to take, etc. And so from very early on, you know, we had, we're building uh, inventory, online inventory tools, etc. to collect household content data. Um, realized very early on, you know, uh, I'm one of those people too that, you know, can't really, it doesn't matter how much sort of time and energy money you put in the UX of, of an inventory tool, you know, you're still having to itemize everything that you have in your home and, and really nobody has the time or inclination to do that. So although that launched and it started to, to get traction, um, you know, towards the end, we were moving about north of 30,000 people per year uh, on that platform. So, you know, it did, it did go places, uh, although it, it was a slow burner. Um, an offshoot from that was uh, we built um, Bus Survey. And Bus Survey, uh, so for centuries, uh, these removal companies have been sending surveyors around to people's homes, so the more professional companies, right? With literally with a clipboard and uh, a piece of paper form, and they would manually undertake a detailed inventory of everything that someone was about to, to move. Um, they would then Take that data they'd use it to price up your move and then they'd throw away that data um, and so what buzz survey did is it replaced a typical in-home survey with a video survey and it sounds very very simple in many respects it was but you know, spent a long time sort of working with um, industry experts who kind of uh, frame that um, uh, the um, technology and and software around uh, their purposes and uses and again towards the end uh, also a slow banner, um, and actually that brings me to my next uh, uh, virus, or so that it could be the myth of build it and they will come, um, or the myth of market readiness, or it could be that the virus, uh, the tiny 19 virus, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so industry did start to adopt it, uh, uh, so for a survey, you know, we did have over 200 companies in about 17 different countries using it, uh, but it, you know, and that sounds like a lot, but it, it actually wasn't in terms of revenue and income, and it was a real sort of slow burner. And, you know, all this time I'm thinking, um, you know, acutely aware of the fact that 95% of funded startups go out of business. That is a scary statistic, right? And trying to navigate around that and wanting to obviously be in that 5% that was going to be successful. And I remember watching this TED talk um, that centered around this detailed research that had been done on the reasons why startups fail. And, you know, there were five sort of top reasons that uh, came to the forum. One was 
idea which we discussed. Uh, one was uh, business model, uh, funding, uh, team. And then one of them was timing. And I remember it being really disappointed that the number one reason that came out of this research, why startups fail, is timing. Because as I, you know, I was already off to the races, right? I'd raised my funding, you know, I, there, there was, that was the one factor in that list that was completely out of my control, which was timing. But it's, it's so very true. Uh, and it's the all sort of MySpace Facebook story. And I was already starting to experience it because the reality was that, you know, as much as my software made sense, as much as the business model completely made sense, um, the industry was just really reticent to adopt technology. The renewables industry in particular was just quite anti um, doing that. Um, slightly different experience with BuzzVault and BuzzVault is the InsurTech uh, um, offshoot from those businesses. So now obviously I'm running three businesses under one roof. Um, and this is where I met you, Andrew, as part of the uh, uh, startup bootcamp experience. So for years, you know, I had uh, insurance companies circling going, you know, that data that you're collecting is, you know, it's very valuable. And, you know, home insurers you know, for many years been trying to collect that. And a very good reason why uh, it's very difficult to collect that from, from people. I mean, first of all, nobody wants to provide a long list of everything they own, right? Um, and also it's a bit big brothery. Um, and so actually moving home is one of those sort of rare situations where you take stock and inventory um, of what you have, but also share that with a, with a complete stranger and third party out of necessity, right? And I also had had a, neg you know, again, coming back to the disgruntled customer situation. And, you know, this is now a very famous story that I pitched time and time again, which was my burglary story of coming home to find my home completely ransacked, et cetera. And then needing to uh, tell my home insurer everything that I'd lost and going, you know, I, I just, I don't have the evidence and receipts, et cetera. And that's nuts. And, Horrible, horrible uh, nightmarish pro process and ended up recovering about 50% of my stone and stuff. Did some research, turns out that we all underestimate what we own to the tune of 40%, right? So it's a very real problem. So here I am with, I've unearthed another very real customer problem. I've already built technology, et cetera, to be collecting what I saw as being the answer, which is you know the household content data. And so I ended up partnering with Munich Re Digital Partners, got my big investor on board, White Mountains, who invested about 20 million in, in, in total over, over the course of the time that we were running it. And going back to the timing um, point, right, you know, th this was a totally different experience. So when we launched that product, you know, and as a startup, obviously you have all of these beautiful TVs around with your metrics boards. And for once, you know, they sort of lit up like Christmas trees and started like pinging away going sales, you know, and we were literally growing our sales 100% month over month, which was extremely exciting. I thought, yes, you know, finally, you know, we're, we're, we're off, we're on our way. Um, and, but by this time, you know, I built, you know, a monster in and of itself, which was the buzz monster, right? Because I'm running, running three companies on the one umbrella with overheads that were just crazy out of control um, as much as we try to cut things down and be lean. On paper, it made sense, right? You've got moving people who are moving as part of businesses that are already gener generating revenue in themselves and they can become home insurance customers as well. And so it all made sense. We built this big ecosystem and, you know, over time that would uh, um, pay dividends. Uh, but, you know, and we were very much in growth mode going, you know, it, this is working where you know we've got product market fit here we're getting four or five star trust pilot reviews every single day from our customers they love what we're doing from an insurance point of view so let's just grow and it's very difficult to focus on growth and profitability at the same time right it's a completely different conversation everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face right that famous mike tyson quote and you know Again, the whole timing thing just came to bite me in the backside because although everything else seemed to align, um, it, you know, I, the one thing I couldn't forecast for was a pandemic. Um, and so because we uh, weren't gross profitable yet, uh, I was still reliant on funding and I did have that lined up. Uh, but the timing for that was we were supposed to close that around March, April of 2020, which is exactly when we all went into lockdown. 
investors got cold feet, um, it just became impossible to raise money and, and kind of the rest is history in that respect. So, so you know, pr pretty heartbreaking and uh, at first, as you can imagine, that's not how I, I hoped things to go, but, um, you know, that that's, that's the thing about timing. And, you know, there are other businesses, for example, Peloton, um, which I will admit, I, I have finally succumbed to, to all of the adverts and, and joined that cult. Whoa. But look, Andrew, look, at, it's it's snowing outside, I, you know, and I'm, I'd, I'd prefer to like admire that from inside. I'm not gonna go out running in that weather. So I have to say, <laughs> it's been an absolute godsend being able to get on that Peloton. But anyway, if you look at it, right, it's like crazy business model. It's a real serious piece of kit that they're sending into people's homes. They're not getting the upfront payment for it because people are paying over the course of three, four, five years uh, on a monthly basis. And yet, you know, for them, the stars are completely aligned because everybody's having to work out at home. And so for them, obviously, timing has been an absolute godsend and, and it really worked for them. And, um, and that really did save them because just before the pandemic struck, as far as I understand, they were in seriously precarious financial position because yeah. everybody was yeah. going, what's the point? Just either go to the gym or buy a damn standalone bicycle or use your own bicycle and stick it on a stand. And, and, and there was no need for that whole sense of community now and collaborative challenge that you get through Peloton. And I think that it's the the, the community need and, and this whole reconnecting with everybody but on a virtual way is what saved Peloton. If it hadn't been for the virus, I'm not sure that they would have been able to survive. No, I totally agree. That, yeah, and give money was being plowed into them and it was just going yeah. nowhere. That's the thing. And uh, uh, so for them, you know, obviously uh, uh, the whole time thing did work out um, and it's, it's brilliant the community aspect and quite competitive person at heart um, so you know that that will motivate me seeing myself pitted up against a virtual community but yeah before this there's, there's no way I would have I would have preferred going to a gym or, or getting outdoors and getting some vitamin d so 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 that so yeah and then um, so that brings me to my final virus, uh, probably the most insidious one of them all, which is um, startup code appendicitis, right? And what that is, is, uh, you know, there's this idea that entrepreneurs have to become absolutely obsessed with their startup, right? To, for, like to the point of delusion. And this actually comes back full circle to our conversation about being able to kill your darlings. And there's, there's more to it, though, in that it just becomes such a big part of your identity, um, being a startup CEO and having that business. Um, and therefore, you know, can really, you can, as I did, really start attaching your own sort of self-worth to it. And so it kind of becomes almost like an unhealthy codependent relationship, you know, where you're so attached to something. And the danger of that, obviously, is that if you lose it, which ultimately I did, you know, it feels like you're losing a big part of yourself. Um, and, you know, a lot of mental health problems <laughs> and it, it arise as a result of that. And there have been some really brave uh, startup CEOs uh, like Tom Blomfield from Monzo, for instance, who've spoken up about it recently. And I have a lot of respect for that because there's a real kind of, glamorous idea it's, it's it's so far from glamorous but also you know an incredibly lonely lonely job we were chatting about it before we we started this podcast about how you know you, you, there needs to be this continuous show of strength with your team because if people on your team have taken a risk to be part of your journey and your vision right your investors have plowed so much money into this business and so everybody wants to see that you know you're this strong person that's going to lead your startup to success and that can be really quite difficult because, you know, um, uh, and so you do end up like throwing so much of yourself into it. And if there's one thing that, you know, why I do think that repeat entrepreneurs are more successful is because they can practice, you know, what I like to call this kind of loving detachment, right? So 
you're loving and that you, you're still passionate about what you do and you're motivated enough to make it successful, but you can be detached enough to kind of go, to be able to let go when you need to. And so if I had my time again, there are components of my business that I probably would have killed off sooner. So for instance, I, I could have said, you know, um, the time isn't right for the moving side of the business, whereas clear, you know, and I need to plow everything into the insurance side of things because that's clearly taking off. But, you know, I was so attached to these parts that you know, I spent years and years and years building. Um, so yeah, uh, startup code appendicitis um, is a thing. Um, and so I suppose you could say I'm on my own 12 step program of recovery right now, which includes taking fearless moral inventory, which includes talking to you right now. And yeah, it's taken a few months really for me to be able to talk about it even because, you know, um, when you lose that, it hurts. Uh, and it's a real lesson to, yeah, I will absolutely do it again. Building startups is part of my DNA. I love it, I absolutely love it. Um, but never will I become that sort of obsessed and attached with something that's outside of myself again, because it's just not healthy. So that's and it. I, I I really appreciate the fact that that you've shared the story for the first time in terms of the struggle that you've been through, um, that you've shared it on this show. Um, really do appreciate that open and honesty because that very last point I think is something that it, it's a message that more startup founders need to hear because they do get so intrinsically wrapped up with their brand. I mean, to a lot of people, Tom Blomfield was Monzo. Monzo was Tom Blomfield. Um, and, and to a lot of people, him stepping down or stepping away and, and, and leaving out of there, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, you have to learn to build the brand as a separate entity and not intertwine yourself so strongly with the brand that you can't detach. And as mm -hmm. you say, you've got to think of yourself as almost as a foster parent, um, right. whereby, yeah. you know, foster parents will love the children to bits and give them the ground that they need, but let them free when they need to go. And they know that the day will come. And there's a lot of there's a lot of startup founders that I've met as well that um, because of their attachment to the company, they can't recognize when the time is right for them to step down as CEO because the DNA of a startup CEO is generally, and I am generalizing, different from what is required for a scale-up CEO. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so if you're a good startup CEO, when it gets time to scale up, it's usually time to bring in a different personality type, different kind of a person. And for you maybe to take over strategy, product, something like that, be the visionary, maybe even be the figurehead for a while, be the chair, but not the no longer the CEO. And the number of CEOs that have ended up losing their companies because they're they haven't been able to detach from that because it's so much part of their identity that they believe if I'm not the CEO of X, who am I then? And you mm -hmm. just can't let that there. You just can't let that identity crisis ever take place mm. for you to be a success. And as you yeah. say, I think the serial entrepreneurs and serial stuff that, that are, are people that have, have figured that one out. They figured mm. out that the way to do it is you put your energy in, you build the brand, and you recognize up front that there will be a time for you to part. And you've got to be able to recognize that or or help to be led down that path when it's time for you to move on and let go. So I do wish you well on your path to recovery from <laughs> startup code appendicitis. And well underway, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> and your next steps of your journey. If people want to hear um, more from you, more about you, learn more about you, uh, LinkedIn, good place for them to find out? LinkedIn's a pretty good place to start, yeah. Absolutely. You're not on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Clubhouse? Anything no, else? no, I'm pretty. LinkedIn works absolutely fine Perfect. for me. So yeah, please do drop me a message on there. I will put that in the show notes. Becky, 
thank you so much for coming on it's to the sharing thank the you. story and i look forward to your speedy recovery from your virus <laughs> all right thanks andrew Cheers. bye take care